This is lesson two of Hadoop Spark Fundamentals Live Lessons, running Hadoop on a desktop or laptop. A real Hadoop installation, whether it be local cluster or in the cloud, can be difficult to configure and possibly an expensive proposition. In order to make the examples of this tutorial more accessible, you learn how to install the Hortonworks HDP Sandbox on a desktop or laptop. The Sandbox is a freely available Hadoop virtual machine that provides a full Hadoop environment, including Spark. You can use this environment to try most of the examples in this tutorial. In this lesson, you learn how to install Hortonworks HDP Sandbox using Oracle VirtualBox. By the way, HDP stands for Hortonworks Data Platform. If you would rather learn about Hadoop and Spark installation details, we will also do a direct single machine install using the latest Hadoop and Spark source code. In this lesson, we're going to install Hortonworks Hadoop and Spark HDP Sandbox. Now this is a virtual machine, so you'll need some type of uh, software to run virtual machines, and I assume you're going to install this on a laptop or a, a desktop. We're going to use VirtualBox from Oracle. There are other uh, machines you can use uh, that will work very similar. And before I start, I want to mention that you will need a fairly beefy laptop or desktop to run this virtual machine. And for instance, this laptop that I'm using has 16 gig of RAM and a uh, i7 with four cores and eight threads, so it can handle uh, some excess loads. The, uh, this is a MacBook Pro. And I also have an SSD in it, so it'll give you an idea of how long things take. Um, booting the, the uh, virtual machine can take some time, depending upon how much RAM you have. And we'll uh, see what I mean by that in a little bit. So first, if you don't have it already, you can download VirtualBox. And uh, it can run on Windows, OS X, Linux, or Solaris hosts. And what, so whatever host you get this running on VirtualBox, the Sandbox machine will run on whatever host you have. It's independent because it runs within, it's a virtual machine and will run in VirtualBox. There's only one version of the uh, Sandbox machine. So we're not going to go through that. I assume you can do it, uh, just download and uh, for whatever platform. And we pulled down the OS X version. So once you have that pulled down and installed, the next thing you're going to need to do is go to Hortonworks. And incidentally, the, you can go to virtualbox.org to get VirtualBox. And we're going to go to hortonworks.com to get the sandbox. Now the web page changes and has different looks at various times, but there's almost always a link to the sandbox on the front page, which is right here. So we're going to click here. And then we see we're on the sandbox page and it has download sandbox. And right here, we're going to go to download for virtual box. So you can run under VMware or Docker. We're using virtual box. So we'll click on that and download the information and we're not going to watch that but once it and it wait will take a little bit to download it's a rather large file so we'll come back once that's downloaded and then we'll start up VirtualBox and load it okay we're back now in the uh, applications window of the finder and we're just going to click on VirtualBox down here and it's going to start and say welcome to VirtualBox. And what we're going to need to do is to load up our virtual machine. And to do that, we just go up here to File, Import Appliance. And then we go to this little file folder over here to find the virtual machine. And it's in Downloads. And there it is right there, HDP 
2.61 Docker VirtualBox, some version numbers, so forth. And then I'm going to open it. You're going to see the um, default settings for the machine. One of the things I'm going to do is increase my amount of RAM. Since I do have 16 gigs, I'm going to bump this up to 12 gigs. And I can do that by clicking here and entering approximately 12 gigs of memory. And once we've done that, we're going to leave this at four cores because we do have actually eight threads. So we can handle four, four cores and also have four virtual threads for using OS type stuff. So we should be good there. Um, we're going to, it's going based on a Red Hat 64 bit. Everything else can be the same. Uh, just so you know, with eight gigs of memory, um, things are going to take a long time to uh, start up. Once you're running, it won't be too bad. And uh, the more, more memory, the better. So we're going to do that and we're going to click on import. Now it's going to load the machine into VirtualBox and we're going to pause because this can take a few minutes and who likes watching scroll bars go across the screen, progress bars. So we'll take a little pause here and you can see we finished up loading the appliance and here it is here in our VirtualBox window and if we click on it we're going to see some of the parameters we already saw. For instance, uh, here, this is the video memory. If we click on system, we're going to see here's the amount of memory we gave it, the number of processors, etc. So, and that can be changed each time you start the, the virtual machine, but not once it's running. So then all we're going to do is press start here, and it's going to start and boot up the machine. And we will get a, an actual window, which is like the terminal for our virtual machine that's running in VirtualBox. And it's if you're familiar with uh, booting a Linux system, it's going to look very familiar. And this will take some time, however, so we're going to pause again until this completes. So if the virtual machine booted, and was successful we should see this monitor window here giving us this message telling us to point our local browser to uh, 127.00.1 colon 8888 and so this is a way for our local browser to communicate with the virtual machine so let's do that and we'll go back to our browser here and I've already done this so it shows up in my browser and I'll just click on that. So here we are at that port 8888 and if everything worked correctly you should see this screen that looks like this and there's one side here you can click on new to HDP which we're not going to do right now. However if you're interested in exploring it it's certainly a, a nice tutorial to take a look at. The other is Advanced HDP, and we're going to use that just so we can explore a few quick links. And we'll click on that. So the first thing we're going to click on and, and take a look at is Ambari. Now in later lessons, we're going to take a real big look on how to install Ambari and use Ambari on a cluster. But here we're just using it as part of the virtual machine, so it's only for one node. But in any case, can be very instructional just to see what it what it looks like so we'll take this click on this one and here's the address it's the same URL except for a different port and we notice that the password and username is Raj underscore ops so let's do that and take a look and so we're going to sign in now and see what Ambari looks like. So, 
And what we see is a whole bunch of little windows telling us status of various things. Um, very quickly down the left side here are all the services and they don't even fit into our window here. And then um, basically there's things we're going to learn about HDFS. It'll tell us about HDFS data nodes. We only have one data node. You can see it here. One of one working and it makes sense because we're a single virtual machine. Node managers. We've got one node manager which makes sense. And down here there's some supervisors. We don't have one of those available and we're not going to worry about that too much now since this is only a virtual machine. So you can take a look at this and play around with it. I go through this whole uh, series of menus in a later section. So this is just to show you what it looks like. So we're going to log out of this and we'll close this window here. The next thing I wanted to bring your attention to and we'll be taking a look at this later is Zeppelin which is a GUI for doing workbooks with Hive and Spark and I'm not going to go through it because I go through it in, a, in another lesson but just to show you what the Zeppelin interface looks like and this is how you would get to it on the virtual machine and again it's you could type it in by yourself it's 127.001.9995 so we'll close this guy again and the final one I wanted to mention was SSH client is that you can SSH into the virtual machine from a either from a terminal or actually if we scroll down a little bit here we can see it from a web client we're just going to use a terminal window on this MacBook and so uh, we recommend getting SSH client if you don't have one. Most Linux and Mac systems have them automatically. With Windows, we in the previous lessons, we mentioned how to get an SSH client up and running, either PuTTY or, um, well, PuTTY's probably the best one at, at this point to pull down and use. There's MOBA XWIN, which is, which is good as well. So let's, uh, let's jump over to an actual terminal and run this and see what this looks like. So we'll go here and here's our terminal. And I'm going to scroll back to the command. And we just SSH as root to 127.0.0.1 port 2222. And it's going to ask for a password, and that password is Hadoop. And as soon as we give that, it's going to tell us it wants us to change our password. So I'm going to enter the current password. And now I'm going to enter my new password. And there we have it. We are now able to access the sandbox through an SSH term on our laptop. So let me clear this window and to prove to you that this is actual running Hadoop installation HDFS DFS dash LS slash and that's just we're going to list the HDFS file system and there it is and we can see on the left side here all the directories that we would expect from a Hadoop installation and again as I mentioned we're going to go through this kind of installation in full with Ambari but this is we can see we've got data in HDFS it's up and running we've only got one single data node but that's fine it's enough for us to do a lot of the exercises that we're going to do in all these lessons so a few more uh, URLs I wanted to point out that aren't in the uh, startup window there. And let's go back here. So another one I want to point out is the um, if you actually want to see what the name node or the Hadoop file system window looks like. So there's a URL for that. So it's 127. And the port number is 570. And again, it's just the same one, 127.0.0.1 colon 570. And that gives us our overview of HDFS 
on this in this virtual machine and you can see here we don't have configured capacity we have 41 gigs so we're not going to be doing any big data with this system although that's plenty enough to to learn a few things and you can we're going to go through this again this interface later but just to show you that it's available and then one more the uh, yarn jobs manager that we can get to through port 8088 and here's all applications and as we run jobs they'll show up in this window here and just to show you that when later and later on when we talk about some of these interfaces here's how you get to them and they all just use the local port local host name IP and various port numbers there are some other things you may want to explore here however at this point we're convinced that the Let's go back here that our virtual machine is up and running. And what we need to do is to complete this lesson is shut it down. And to do that, we just close this window. And we can do three of things, save machine state, send the shutdown signal, power off the machine. So we're just going to power off the machine at this point. Click OK. And... If we go back to our virtual box, you can see the machine's powered off. And if you want to start it again, you just hit start. So as you could see, we're able to do some things on the, the laptop while the virtual machine was running by virtue of having plenty of memory. So I want to make sure I emphasize that 16 gig at a minimum really makes it usable. So with that, we'll conclude our lesson on installing VirtualBox and the Hadoop's Sandbox virtual machine. In this lesson, we're going to download and install Apache Hadoop from the official website. And you can go to this website if you want. There's lots of additional Hadoop information. It's hadoop.apache.org. And you can also see over here on the left, there's a getting started and downloading Hadoop links that can give you further information. And it, in addition to Hadoop, uh, this lesson is going to include installing Hive and Pig at the end. So the, we're actually doing a little bit more than the typical Hadoop install. And that should enable you to do most of the examples in the uh, remaining lessons. Okay, so let's hop over to a text two text windows actually and get started installing our software okay here we are we have a uh, one text window here on the right and I have another working window here on the left and what we're going to be doing is following along this is the notes file for lesson 2.2 that you can download all these files and um, code from the um, additional material so you don't have to stop, pause, cut and paste or type things in. You can cut and paste directly from these files which is partly what I'm going to be doing in this lesson to speed things up so you don't have to watch me mistype things. So what are, what are we going to do? Well the first thing is just reiterate here that uh, this is CentOS 6.9 and any CentOS 6 will work. And then this is version 2.81 of Hadoop. This is the latest version as, as of when I made this video. So the first thing we need to do is download the package. And to do that, we're going to use wget, which is available on almost every Linux installation. And that's just going to go to the website, pull down the file Hadoop 2.81, tar.gz and we're not going to do that because why have you watched me download a file is not a very good thing to do and we are going to extract the package into slash opt and if you don't have opt on your distribution you can make it using this command 
it's simple enough, but it's probably already there. And this could be actually any directory you choose to run this. These commands should be done as root. I have to emphasize that uh, because we're doing some major installation things across the system. And a lot of this is going to be done by a script, and I also have a cleanup script so that you can undo everything that we've done here, and I'll show those in a minute. So the first command we're going to run is this command to extract Hadoop 2.0. 8.1 into slash opt. So let me just copy that here and go over to our working window. And just to show you, in this working window, we've got a directory called files that has some of the setup files that the Hadoop script will use. We have a Hadoop setup script that's going to go through a lot of the tedious stuff we need to do. The notes file, which we have in this window over here. There's our notes file that we'll be scrolling through, and then a cleanup script, as I mentioned. So the first thing, let me clear this off. The first thing we're going to do is extract our downloaded file into opt. And there's our command. And we're going to cut and come back when this is all done. Okay, we're all done. And let me just clear this off so we have a nice clean clean screen and let's go back to our window here so what we've done thus far is just extract the software and the next thing we want to do is make sure that we we've got open jdk 1.7 installed there is a location on the Hadoop wiki that tells what are the best Java versions to use. The OpenJDK is part of the Red Hat Enterprise Linux, CentOS, Scientific Linux, or other rebuilds. The, uh, there is Java 1.8 available, however, it's not recommended yet in, in the wiki. So we're going to stick with 1.7. So these are the two basic RPMs you need to have installed. And in order to install them, if you don't have them, you can use this command right here. And it's in the notes. And it's just using yum. And this, again, has to be done as root. And you're installing these two packages to make sure that uh, you're using the right version of Java. And then we're going to want to make sure that we are using the correct Java path, and that's this path right here, after the packages are installed. And to do that, it's very simple. simple. We're just going to use this command here. And we're going to paste it into our working window here. And all this command really does is this line export Java home, which is a, a environment define and it's giving the path to our version of Java and it exports that or writes it to Etsy profile D Java dot SH and that's basically going to every time we log in that is going to get run so we get this basically predefined for us it's just a convenience thing I didn't include this in the script because this may change for your installation and it's just something that as an administrator hopefully you only have to do once. And then there's one other define and that's Hadoop home that makes this is a again a convenience thing and it's basically saying our Hadoop home is right here where we just extracted our files. So this command again copy go over to our window, paste it in, and run it, and we're good. One more thing to do, and that's right here. We'll run both of these commands at once. We're going to source those commands, those little shell scripts, because they will get run when we log in. So since we're already logged in, we'll just use the source command and run them 
now. So we'll do that. And we're pretty much good to go at this point. Let's clear this off. So if we wanted to check our profiles, we could, for instance, env, pipe that into grep, search for Hadoop, and there's our define we just put in there. So uh, same thing will be for, for Java Home. Now, there are two ways we could go at this point. And there is the script method, and there's the by hand method. Both of them do exactly the same thing. Uh, obviously, the script's a lot easier. So what I'm going to do is go through the steps that the script performs and then run the script. These, can again, can be done by hand, basically just admin commands that need to be run. And I'll go through them real quickly and setting up some config files. So basically, um, we need to, we're going to add a group Hadoop. And then we're going to have users for the various daemons that are going to run. One is Yarn. One is HDFS for Hadoop Distributed File System. And one is MapRed for MapReduce. So we're just going to add these three users. The next thing we're going to do is under slash var data Hadoop HDFS, we're going to make a bunch of subdirectories. And using the P option, we're going to do all these in, in one step. And these are the directories where the data are going to be stored. So if your var partition on whatever system you're using is really small, you may fill it up with data rather quickly if you're trying some different things with Hadoop. If it's larger, you shouldn't have any problem. Again, it's a single directory where all the data are going to go. And the other thing, once we get these directories made, we're just going to change the ownership right here. And that's changing it to the group Hadoop and the owner is HDFS. And I'll mention this again, but in Hadoop HDFS, the user HDFS is like root on a Linux system or Unix system. So HDFS is who has total control over the Hadoop distributed file system. And one other tiny step we have to do, and that's just uh, make a log directory, the logs directory in our Hadoop distribution directory. And we just do that here and we give it owner yarn and group Hadoop. So once all that's done, the way that Hadoop is actually controlled and gets options, all the Hadoop components are through a set of core XML, well, a set of XML files. And for our purpose, these are going to be in opt Hadoop 2.81 slash Etsy slash Hadoop. Now what we'll see in when we do some other installs using Ambari, these are actually going to be in Etsy slash Etsy slash Hadoop and uh, some further further directories that uh, they're really at the top of the system. These are embedded basically in our install directory, which is convenient because we can install different versions and different things and try different settings in different versions and not be stepping on each other if they were actually in Etsy Hadoop. So there's a bunch of files here. We have to set some things up. Cord-site.xml. Uh, basically, we have to give a port number for talking to HDFS. And we'll go through these. Uh, there's another one. Here's the hdfs-site.xml. And this is what sets all the HDFS information. And what I want to point out here is there's a parameter called DFS replication. And if you remember back when we talked about HDFS replication, and we'll talk about this a little more, this is how many copies of each data are stored in our HDFS file system. Now, since this is a single file system, a single disk file system, for example, 
we're only going to have one copy. So we're going to have this value of one. In a real production system, this is usually three. So there's three copies, which basically gives us redundancy in our file system. And also makes it easier to find data that uh, and move computation to data out on the cluster. The other thing here is basically we're telling HDFS where some of these directories are, and this was these are the files uh, directories we just set up in var data Hadoop HDFS, and this NN stands for name node, SNN stands for secondary name node, and DN stands for data node, which is actually where the data are actually going to be put. Okay, so the next one is MapReduce dash site.xml, and these are the configurations that needed to be added to that file. I won't go into too much detail at this point. Basically, say that it needs these to operate. And yarn dash site.xml, same thing. We've got a couple more things we need to set there. And then a few things we need to do with these environment files, and that's basically set some sizes and make them uh, a little more amenable to smaller environments such as a laptop or desktop and we'll, we've got all those here and you can read this and and follow along at, later at some point so we've got all those steps and we're now at step 10 to format our hdfs file system so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do all these steps but we're going to do them using the script, which after I just went through all that certainly gives you a sigh of relief that you don't have to do all that by hand. So let's go back to our working window. Let me clear this off and show you that we're in the directory that has our scripts file. And here's our script we're going to use, Hadoop setup script.sh. And we're just going to run that script and it will do all that gobbledygook for us very quickly and presto it says when it's done we have everything set up and in actuality uh, we're ready to go with this step right here now just to mention this script if something screws up or you need to change something in the script this script will clean everything up so you can run that and rerun the, this script and you can these are simple scripts if you know anything about scripting they're easy enough to change to suit your needs so where are we step 10 we want to format hdfs let me roll this down a little bit and to do that we're going to have to su to the hdfs user because as you recall i said hdfs acts as root for hadoop so we're going to su to hdfs cd to opt hadoop slash bin and then we're going to run this command right here and i'll copy the format command and we'll flip over to here so let's Go here, now we're going to SU, and we can ignore that little command there. And then we're going to CD opt Hadoop. And we'll take a little side trip here. Let me clear the screen. This is what the top directory of the Hadoop directory looks like, if you're curious. So there's a bin Etsy, that's where our config files are. Include lib, lib exec. There's that log file we made, sbin, we'll be using that and share. So uh, that's pretty much what it looks like. And then we're going to go to bin here and actually run our format command. And this can take some time and it's going to spew a lot of gobbledygook on the screen as well. So let's run this. And it 
is over and one of the ways you know that it worked is you should see a message in here that looks like something like this and storage directory and this is the one we we made has been successfully formatted so we know that that that's worked okay so let me clear this off and we'll go back to our notes window and the next thing we need to do is start our HDFS services and we're going to move over to the sbin directory and then we've got all these commands here that we're going to run it's going to start the name node the secondary name node and the data node so these are three of the essential daemons that need to be running to have an effective HDFS installation multiple data nodes are what are used in a cluster so you can store data across data nodes so they communicate to the name node across the cluster back and forth so let's uh, grab these here so I should and these are Java processes so we're going to start them and if all goes well that they should work fine so let me do them one after another and I forgot to move to bin so let me oops clear this off I mean move to S bin there we go now we should be okay so we're starting the name node and when it starts it'll give a message that it's done and tells you where the log directories are and we'll talk more about these later but generally if you're having trouble with any of your daemons they all log to various directories and usually when they start they'll give you the path to the directory and this is actually the output file and the logging directory is the same thing except dot log instead of dot out so if we want to make sure and that these guys are running we can just use the JPS command which is Java PS JPS and we see that we've now got name node data node secondary name node the three services that we started they're now running all good news and we've actually got a HDFS file system up and running on our Linux installation so let's clear that off and the next thing we're going to do is just let I want to let you know that the way to stop these services and this was the start you know they all have the start command here is to run them with a stop command same argument here now again these have to be started and stopped as a, as user HDFS so if you're finding they're not stopping or they're not found or something check check that you're using the right user and that's how you can shut these down and by the way the cleanup script does not shut these down that's something that uh, you have to do on your own or reboot the system if, if you so desire the one other thing we have to do is uh, we've got a couple of HDFS commands we've got to run and these are to make some directories in the actual HDFS file system and we'll just do those real quick so this is an HDFS command and what we're going to do and this is actually kind of a nice confirmation that HDFS is working so we're running these HDFS is the command that says do something in the Hadoop file system DFS says it's a distributed file system command and here's a make dir that looks very similar to our Linux command and here's the directory we're going to make now in in uh, other lessons we go over these commands as well but, uh, you can just follow along and 
see that what it is we're doing. So we're making a directory in the HDFS file system. That worked, no complaints. So let's do these other two real quick. And we copy and paste that. And that's happy. And these are basically just directories that uh, are used for the MapReduce history files. And it writes the, the history into HDFS. So that's done. That's good. Now we've got to move over and start the Yarn Services, which is yet another resource negotiator, which is the batch scheduler for Hadoop. And that's going to determine what runs where, which is not a, a hard thing to do on a single node because you've got essentially one system to manage. Yeah, let's go over here, clear this. And now what we've got to do is let's exit out of user HDFS, SU minus over to the user yarn. And we get that SSH message again. We can ignore that. And then we need to go to Hadoop. That's been, and we're going to grab the commands we need to run, which are right here. So we're going to start these three daemons, the resource manager, which is the overall resource management daemon, the node manager that manages the specific node it's on, and then the history server, which will record and keep track of jobs that are running and it's very valuable to see job history after the, the job is run so we'll do that run these commands and again it, it tells us where things are running now let's start that one where things are logging and if we do a JPS there are our Job history server, resource manager, and node manager. And similar to HDFS, the uh, yarn daemon.sh stop node manager will stop the, uh, the node manager and similar, similar daemons. So believe it or not, we're done the install, and now it's time to test some things. And the first thing we can do is we can test the web interfaces to both the HDFS interface and the YARN interface. And to do that, we just need to bring up, in my case, I'll bring up Firefox to this URL. Copy the command. And before we actually paste this, we want to go back to the root account. And we're going to just exit out of the YARN user because our credentials for running X windows are valid for the root account. And I'll paste in the command and it could be any browser actually. And we're going to go to port 570 on the local host. So we'll run that command. And sure enough, we come up with the HDFS GUI and we're not going to go into what all this means. We go over that in later lessons and the idea is basically that uh, we now have a HDFS file system that seems to be up and working and if we page down we can see it gives us information about the file system and that's a good sign now to check and make sure that yarn is running our resource manager we're going to open up another window and that's at localhost 8088 and I have that already in here. And if Yarn is up and running, the good news is that we should see this interface. And this is actually a bit bigger than my window here. And you can see that there was a job here that we're going to run in just a minute that just ran. And that's all good. And again, these two interfaces we'll be going over in later lessons at this point. It's just a way for us to confirm that HDFS and YARN are up and running. 
So let's go back to our text window and run a very simple application that makes sure, gives us a really good confidence that our system's working correctly. And here we go. Here's our web interface that's up. So let's put that in the background. Control Z, B, G, and there it is. Now to run our test, we want to do that as HDFS. Basically because Hadoop won't doesn't like to run things as root and shouldn't. Best user at this point is HDFS. So let's clear that off. Although the screen's going to get real messy real quick. So what we need to do is run this command. We're going to set a define yarn examples, which is just a path to make our... All right, we're getting some errors from our web interface. We don't have to worry about those. It's, so we're going to use this define. And it's just a path so we don't have to type such a big long command. And here is our command to test a Hadoop program in our Hadoop installation. And basically it's the Pi program that's going to calculate Pi. And it's going to use eight maps to do that. And let's run that command. And here we go. And you can see number of maps. And we're going to pause right here and come back when it's done. It should only be a, a, you know, less than a minute, but no sense watching this at this point. So now the program completed. It took us 20 seconds, which, yes, of course, is a very long time to calculate pi. The goal here, though, is to make sure everything's working. And you can see the estimated value of pi right down here. And this is very good confirmation that everything's working. So at this point, we can go move on to other lessons and use this installation to run MapReduce applications and tests and so forth. In the next part Two of this, we're going to install real quickly Hive and Pig so you can do other things with the installation we have here. This is the second part of our installation of Hadoop binaries from the Apache website on a basically a Linux laptop or desktop system. And we're going to install two packages that are very useful with Hadoop. One is called Apache Pig, and one the other is called Apache Hive. And they each have their own website under the Apache.org banner. And the um, installation of Pig is fairly straightforward. And in later lessons, we'll learn about how to use Pig and what it's used for. For right now, we're just going to go over a quick installation of the uh, package. So the first thing we, we're going to want to do is to get a version of pig. And again, all these um, commands are in the notes file for this lesson. So you can do as I'm doing, cutting and pasting. You don't have to pause and write down commands. So uh, I'm not going to do this. You can assume this is already done. And we're using 0 0.17.0, the version of pig. And we would, if we executed this command, we would pull this down into temp. What we're going to do is extract it into slash opt. And in previous steps, we made sure we had an opt directory. So let's do that. There's our command. And there's our screen scrolling by. And let's clear this off. We extracted it now. And then the next thing we want to do, as we've done previously, is set up our profile.d pig.sh script to just set all these the path pig home and the class path for pig. And we'll do that next. And that's pretty much it that you need to install pig. So if we're going to use it, let's jump over to uh, an HDFS login. 
And we'll do that now. And to run pig, we simply type pig. We're going to get a lot of info messages. These can be ignored. And there's ways to turn these off that uh, if, if they really bother you. What we want to make sure we get is this login prompt called grunt, which means we're in the pig interpreter. And the, um, the pig authors have a certain sense of humor. And now you can do pig commands. So we're just going to quit out of that. And now we're back at our command line prompt. So that's pretty much it for installing pig. Very simple, and you can begin to use it right away. So let's uh, clear out of this and go back to our root. And incidentally, all these installations will be done as root. And let's clear this. Next, we're going to, let me scroll down here, install Apache Hive, which is a little bit more involved, and but not too much. And that, this should only take, uh, take you a few minutes now that you, uh, if you follow these steps. Again, we're going to skip the download piece. Uh, right here it is. And what we're going to do is... We're using Hive version 2.3, and we're going to, like we did previously with Pig, we're going to extract it into Opt. And there we go there. And while that's running, we'll hop back to, oh, it's done already. We will hop back to here. And similarly, we have a Hive.sh to set. And we will do that here. And let me clear this off. So we set a path and we set Hive Home. And we put it into Hive.sh. The next thing we need to do is there's a few directories Hive needs in HDFS. So these two commands, we're going to SU over to the HDFS account because that's the root account for the HDFS file system. And we're going to use, I know it's a little bit confusing, the HDFS command, DFS make dir, and here's a directory we're going to make, and then we're going to set permissions. So these two we can actually run after one another. And they sh should be done. We can we can check HDFS DFS LS user hive. And there's our directories that we just made. Okay, next step. There is a Hive site.xml that we need to copy into opt Apache Hive conf directory. This is very short and we'll do that quickly. And this this is in your files directory in the uh, notes file that is available for download. So basically what we're going to do is just enter this command not that command that we already did. Let's copy this one. And it's okay to do those again. They're not going to do anything. There we go. So we're going to copy the hive dot hive dash site XML. The, uh, the contents of this file are very short. And basically this is what's in the file. And the main thing it's going to do is tell us where we can find the local Metastore database. And that's what this guy was here. 
and I'll explain that a little bit more in a second. And then there's one more piece of bookkeeping we have to do. It turns out that both the Hadoop install files and the Hive install files have the same library, which is the log4j for Java library. And we're just going to remove the one or move the one in the Hive directory uh, so there's no conflict. You'll get a warning saying that there's it found two duplicate libraries. And if we do this, we just remove that one and everything is happy. So the next thing we need to do is install a Metastore database for metadata for Hive. Now the default one is Apache Derby, which is a very simple database. If you're going to be using this for multiple users, you probably want to use something like MySQL. Uh, since this is on a personal system, Derby will work just fine. And we're also using Derby 10.2. 1.2.1.1 versions 10.13 plus will not work with Java 1.7 so that's why we're using that so the same thing we're gonna pull this down and then we're going to extract it whoops let's make sure we got this and we'll do extract it And once that's all done, like we've done before, we need to set up a Etsy profile.dderby.sh file. And again, very simple, Derby home, path, so we can find Derby commands. And then right here is something that you may want to change possibly. The location here. Derby system home is basically where it's going to put the data file that it creates. So we're just going to let it write it right into the Derby home slash data. And if this would get real big, this may not be the best place to put it, but for playing around with a hive, this is no big deal. So we're going to run this command. And we've got our Derby all set up now. And then we're going to, as root, we're going to make sure we've got these sourced because we're going to need to do uh, use the defines in them. So we're just going to run these basically so we get Hive Home and Derby Home defined. And there we go. And let's clear this out. And then we have, uh, so we did this step. Now what we're going to want to do is there's some Derby libraries. We cop have to copy over to Hive. And this is why we needed to source these files so we would get Derby Home and Hive Home. Uh, we don't have to. We could write out the full path if we wanted to. But like most computer people, we have a bit of laziness in our blood. So there we go. We've got those two copied. Now we're getting ready to actually get something going. So we're going to do, need to do is get the Derby server running. And the easiest way to do that is just to run this command here, which is going to run this command start network server on the host the uh, local host and it's going to use put it in the background and make sure it keeps running after we exit so to do that we're just going to run this command and if all goes well if you hit return you get your prompt back it will log into this file wherever you started this so there's the file right there. So if I want to, something's going wrong, I want to see what's going on, I can look at this file here. Let's clear this. And incidentally, to stop that Derby daemon is 
base basically this command stop network server so you have start network server stop network server simple enough so the next thing we need to do is run this command schema tool which is part of hive to set up the the hive schema using derby so it just does a lot of database setup and let's run that command now and if all goes well you should see something that looks like this and it should say schema tool completed and let's clear this off so now we're pretty much ready to start hive and use hive so in order to do that we're going to switch over to our hdfs account so we uh, we look more like a regular user so su minus hdfs and here we are over there and then by entering hive we can enter hive and should get the hive prompt so we've got our hive prompt and uh, a few things to note here this issue here which no h base in uh, that's just a slight bug in this version of hive you can ignore that uh, also some of these other logging information and the um, other piece here is it says that hive on map reduce is depreciated in hive 2 and may not be available in future versions well that's fine since we're not on a cluster we're on a single system and just want to learn about Hive, we don't really care about the mechanism underneath and MapReduce, whether it be augmented with Tez or run as uh, Spark, uh, really doesn't matter to us because we're not too concerned about performance. So this is enough to um, for us to learn about Hive. And uh, to just make sure everything's working correctly, we're going to enter the simplest of commands show tables semicolon and hive should come back with an okay which it does and that's a pretty good indication that things are working properly and then to quit we just quit with a semicolon again and we're back to our user prompt so this concludes our installation of hadoop pig and hive from the apache binaries from their website and it should allow you to reproduce this on a single machine notebook or desktop that runs Linux and the notes files has all the configuration in it so you should be able to step through this fairly quickly just like I did In this lesson, we're going to install Spark on a laptop or desktop system running Linux. In this uh, instance, we're using CentOS 6.9, and the Hadoop version we're using is 2.81, which we used in the previous lesson 2.2. We installed that, and we're using Spark version 2.2.0. Now, we don't specifically need Hadoop to install and run Spark. However, since we test our installation by connecting to HDFS, we're going to, um, we're going to need a specified version that we're using here of Hadoop. So to install is actually very simple and we're going to skip some of the um, obvious steps that we've done uh, repeatedly in the other lessons, which is this one here, which is a wget and you can check this notes file for these commands and we're going to pull down the the uh, spark binary and we're also going to untar it and in the op directory and if we don't have opt we're going to make it right here and here we untar it and I should mention that the um, version of spark previous versions have been specific versions of Hadoop, in this case, we have Hadoop 2.7, and you notice that we're running 2.8. That's fine because 
Spark seems to work fine with Hadoop version 2.7 and above without any being specifically tailored to the ver version of Hadoop. In older versions, you used to have to kind of match it to the version of Hadoop you were using. So that's, that's good news. We don't have to worry too much about that. So the first thing we need to do is after we've installed, basically extracted the file, is just set Java home. And the reason this, we, we did this in previous lessons, now this takes a little bit of a twist because Spark requires Java 8. Now, the Hadoop version we installed in the last lesson specifically stated it did not support Java 8, although it actually kind of does in, in things that I've uh, tested. So basically what we're going to do is install Java 1.8.0 OpenJDK and the OpenJDK-Devel and to make sh sure that we've got a version that will work with the latest version of Spark. And I'm pretty sure this, this will, upgrading this will work for the version of Hadoop as well that we've installed. To do that, we're going to run yum install right here. And then after that, the thing we have to do is make sure that we're now, our Java home is pointing to Java 1.8.0. Now, the other thing is in Etsy alternatives slash Java, this is going to point to the version we just installed. So if you're ever in doubt, just run java-version to see which version you're using. But as we follow the instructions here, we're going to be using 1.8. So we'll ex execute this command. That's going to tell us use that Java. And just to be sure, there's our, our version right here. So Spark should be happy with that. Now, it turns out that once we have that set, we're pretty much ready to run Spark. Now, because this is just an install and not a Spark lesson, which we'll have later in some of the later lessons, we're just going to verify that Spark's working and installed. So we're going to jump to the installation directory, which is where it extracted under opt. And let's clear this off. So let's jump to that directory. And in that directory, we're just going to run a simple Spark Pi example which is very similar in the way it calculates pi, which is a Monte Carlo method to other Hadoop uh, tests that we've run. And so let's just run that. So that's in the bin directory. And off we go. And if all goes well, we should see buried in all these information messages. This Pi is roughly 3.135. Now you notice it's not even 3.14, and that's because it didn't use that many points to determine the value of pi. So this is just make, to make sure things are working. Now these info messages can be turned off, but if after an installation and testing things, it's usually good to run them. So that's good news. And the other thing we can do is run a Spark shell so we can interactively do Spark kinds of things. Now this one is a Scala shell. And to start that, let's clear this. We simply enter this command, bin Spark shell, and that's going to locally start a interactive shell on our system. And once it's ready, we get this ASCII art Sparks logo here. And here we have the Scala prompt, which is the basically default Spark interface. And as I said, we're not going to go into how to program in Spark. However, um, the thing we do need to know is how to quit out of this, and that's a colon Q. And there we go. And we'll clear that out. And the next thing we're going to test is 
the PySpark, the Python interface to Spark, which, which lets you basically program in Python and use all the features that are offered in Spark. And to do that, we're going to enter this command. Now we're going to add a little bit to this. And let's just hop over here first. And so we're going to run PySpark, and now we're going to give it the argument dash dash master, which is saying run the master on the local system and use two threads. And if we had more cores on this system, we could run more threads and matching the number of threads to cores if we wanted to. So that's a way to use more of the capabilities of modern processors than just using one thread. Now if you didn't, in the last instance, we didn't use this dash dash master local square brackets two, we could have, and we would have had two threads as well. So let's just run this and have it start up. And of course you need to have Python installed. And if the Python version isn't correct, it probably won't start up correctly. And we're running 2.6 and 2.6.6 and it seems to be working okay so just be aware that uh, there may be some version issues if you have an older version of Python and then to quit this we could either uh, the easiest way is just control D and that brings us back to our prompt so let's clear that off now there's one other um, new thing that's nice with Spark. Ah, before that, we can also run our PySpark Py example. And incidentally, th these are available for you to play with as well. So just to make sure everything's copacetic with PySpark, there we go. And it's off and running. And somewhere in here, here we go. Here's the answer, approximate value. And again, it's a Python program that does the same thing as the Scala program does. If you prefer Python, you can use that language. So let's clear this. And as I mentioned, one of the neat things is now that it's somewhat experimental, but there's an R interface. And we can start that up. And you can now program in R using Spark, the Spark features. And again, we're not going to go into details of that, but just so you know that's there. And this also requires that you have a compatible version of R installed. And you, you can then check the documentation to see how to program in this. We're going to, in these lessons, mostly focus on PySpark, but just to let you know it's there and if you to test it for your installation. So to quit here, Q empty quote, empty brackets, and no, we don't want to save our workspace. We didn't do anything, and that should do, do it for us. Now, after those commands, we're fairly comfortable that Spark is working, and we can actually try some different types of Spark things and programs, etc., on our single node installation. If we wanted to connect to HDFS, which is usually a nice thing, then what we need to do is first make sure HDFS is started. And let's go ahead and do that using these commands here. Now notice we're going to start it using Java 1.8. And before we were using 1.7, everything should be all right. And there's some notes here about uh, we're actually going to change Etsy profile Java sh to reflect that so that our default everything's going to default to java 1.8 so you can consult these notes if this is a little confusing to you or you you want to double check and make sure everything's working correctly so basically what we're going to do we're, these commands and i'll just go over them quickly we're going to su over to user hdfs we're going to cd to the hadoop bin directory and then we're going to start the name node, the data node, and the secondary name node so that we have HDFS up and running. And then to make sure everything is working, we're going to put a simple file 
into HDFS and we're going to use that in a second and then we're going to exit back to root and if you haven't noticed uh, we've been doing all this as root and when you actually start to run programs and so forth it's best to do it as a user and you can set up path names and so forth to access spark so let's do this quick we'll do these two commands quickly and so we su to user hdfs now we're going to move to our sbin directory and if we take a look we see that there's all these stopping and starting and daemon uh, scripts to sh start daemons and so forth and all the one we're really worried about is are these three here which are going to start the name node the data node and the secondary name node now we did all this in the previous lesson so i'm just going to chunk these out and run them all at the same time one after another and we should if when we get done and everything started if we do a JPS we should see all three of these running yep there it is and let's take a look what's actually in there in our directory And I forgot that we need to use spell out user in the Hadoop. So there we go. And here we can see we actually have this. We have two files, a password file that we used in another example, and this file distribute sh. And that's there because the next command was to put that file there. And that file is actually in our. Uh, directory that we're working in right now so let's clear this so there's the file and I'm not going to rerun the put command because it's already there and HDFS doesn't like to overwrite things so basically I've got this file in the HDFS user directory in HDFS and of course it's very confusing when you have a user HDFS and the file system called HDFS that can be a little confusing in the notes whenever I refer to the file system I do it in caps and when I refer to the user I use lowercase so essentially we've got all this done and we now have HDFS running so we can read and write to it as we just did here we can see files and so forth so it's up and running if this command didn't work or our put command didn't work then something's wrong with HDFS okay so we're going to exit out of this and go back to our where we were as root and we're going to very simply start a spark shell as we did previously there we go we need to start a spark shell we got all this gobbledygook on our screen again and here we come down down here we're at the spark prompt and we're basically going to enter a command right here that assigns to a spark context a text file and the text file comes from HDFS on the local host port 9000 and I'll mention in a minute where we got this information and here's the path to the file user HDFS distribute dash exclude dot sh so we're going to run that command and we're going to get some response and don't really need to worry too much about it and all we're going to do is to make sure that it worked we're going to count the number of words in that file and that's what this command does text file dot count and it's going to think a little bit and then now we've got 81 and that's actually not the words I believe that's the number of lines in any case that worked and 
we can quit that. And so that means when we program, if we want to write applications that read data from HDFS, we can do that, which is nice because sometimes we might use Hive or Pig to generate a file that we want to use, and then that file can be used by Spark. Okay, let's clear this. So one final thing, and that is where did I get that information? And that's what we're going to talk about real quick right down here. In the Hadoop install, there's a Hadoop 2.8.1 Etsy Hadoop core site.xml. In the previous lessons, we edited, I actually had a script to set up these XML files with options in them. And in the core site XML file, there is this line here. And the key part is right here. This is where we assign the HDFS interface, basically how to contact HDFS on this line. And there's more XML surrounding this, but basically we tell it the local host on port 9000. So when we're running these guys up here, these commands looking for data in HDFS using Spark, we just need to tell it, well, just tell it it's HDFS we're looking for, here's the port, and then just follow with the path in HDFS. So it's pretty simple. And if for some reason this port's different in your core-site.xml file, then you need to change that here. And then finally, we're not going to do this, but if you're not planning on using it, you can use these commands here to basically stop HDFS from running on the system. So that's basically it. The uh, Spark install is not too difficult. Now, that, again, this is a single instance. It's not a cluster install Spark. That can be done fairly easily as well. We're not going to go into that detail because when we use Spark, we're actually going to use it as part of the Hortonworks open source installation that will run across a cluster. The idea is exactly the same. And you can check the Spark website for more detail on how to run a uh, Spark cluster on its own. So you would need other systems, but this lesson is basically so you can get Spark up and running on your laptop, say, or desktop, and then try some things that we'll talk about later in, in more of these lessons.